And I think we will maybe just start with presenting ourselves. I'm Caroline Lea, some of you may, may know me already. I'm heading the Professorship of Translation Studies at the Institute of Translation um, and Interpreting at Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And next to me is my new um, co-head of, of <laughs> Institute, Alice Delorme. She's also the professor for um, human machine communication. communication. Yeah. And um, I think I'll pass the floor to her for the first slides. Thank you very much. So um, because it is Friday and we all could really, really have some good news we need them <laughs> <laughs> at this time, uh, I will start the presentation with good news, indeed. Um, so when we look at the language industry, um, we can see that it is a, a booming industry, a very good, a very healthy industry. Um, it was estimated um, around 26 billion US dollars uh, um, in 2021 which meant that uh, it, it grew by 12, almost 12% in, in comparison to the previous year. So everything's actually doing fine. And if you are like me and you don't really like figures in the morning, uh, then maybe you like the charts. So the projected growth is actually stunning. So we really have a language industry that is healthy, that is good, and everything's fine. So I can stop speaking and we can uh, just go to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it has grown throughout the pandemic. Exactly. Right? So yeah. it was, uh, mm -hmm. as you, yeah. So still remains the questions. Um, yeah, you know, what happens with the elephant in the room? Of course, neur neural machine translation and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, is the language industry booming, but maybe the machines are doing all the, all the work? And actually, it's not the case. As you can see here, we have the language industry job index. And uh, of course, it went a bit down during the early stage of the pandemic. But still, uh, at the moment, it's really it's thriving. So there are more jobs than ever in the language industry. And the language industry is, going, is doing pretty well. Um, so that's the good news for today, and uh, there is no bad news actually, so that's also good news. But still remains the question, if everything's doing so smoothly, so fine and so great, why uh, are we talking about change all the time in the language industry? Um, um, and what are the challenges? Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. Exactly, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> lost it a bit. And well, of course, uh, I think we will all agree upon the fact that if we look at the process that uh, translators uh, or the translation processes um, in general, they have been uh, disrupted, not disturbed, but disrupted by the rise of the machines of neural machine translation, especially in AI. So we could uh, represent the translation process as, as uh, this, seeing that the translator or the post editor or the linguist, let's say linguist, is in the middle of the, of the process. And um, they work with a lot of tools like translation memory, term base, Q&A tools, and, um, and of course now on the empty engines, more or less. Um, if we keep this vision, then the challenges are here only, and they are not, not very simple, but they are very restricted and very limited. For example, dealing with uh, what probably all of you know, dealing with false fluency in, in machine translation, translated text, or dealing with biases, or knowing um, by uh, as a fact that post-editing a machine translating text is definitely not the same as uh, revising a human translation. So this is the kind of stuff that we have to um, to deal with when we work with machine translated texts. And there are still many challenges that haven't been talked about or investigated at the moment. But actually, this is not what, um, this is not the whole picture, let's say it like that, because the challenge is more complex. Because when we talk about AI, we talk about AI here uh, as an empty engine, although actually it is nowadays uh, very often integrated into the translation memory. So actually, it should be up uh, in the translation memory um, um, part too. But it is not only there, because it could be in the source content already, because nowadays with OpenAI or Jasper or Copy AI, you have automated text generation tools that provide uh, really fluent texts. Um, they rely on almost the same technology as uh, neural machine translation. So it could be that in the near future or already, 
uh, translators have to translate texts that have been produced by machines and we don't know if they have been revised by humans, for example. So this is a challenge that is really, really at our doorstep. Then term base, for example, can also be something where AI uh, is involved because there is a lot of work on automatic term extraction for uh, large collections of documents, for example. So it means that when you work with a term base, uh, maybe in a company or in an institution, you cannot be completely certain that it is uh, a term base that has been made manually by humans, or maybe it has been made by an AI, or maybe it's a combination of both. So there, there is also AI in the uh, in the loop here, uh, or it can be at least. Um, of course, quality assurance tools can be AI-driven, AI-based. We all know that uh, MT developers uh, spend a lot of time developing metrics and, and automatic evaluation systems for, for their tools. So, so as a result, evaluation can also be made by AI or involve AI in, at some point in the process. And last but not least, the final translation product that we usually make for a target audience, a target reader, will probably <laughs> be um, um, very often also something that has to be fed into a machine, being for automatic text classification or document classification or for search engine optimization so that uh, when, you, when you look something up in Google, then the text that you have translated um, appears uh, in, in the top results, for example. So not only will we be translating for or, or preparing text for a target audience, but probably also for a target machine or engine. Seeing that, you cannot, uh, yeah, you cannot no longer say that uh, AI is one more tool in our tool shed. It is something that is pervasive to the whole process of um, translation, and it requires a constant adaptation to expert in the loop production models. A constant adaptation because you. There are many, many uh, possibilities where AI could be involved or not in the process. What is really important here, though, is that the human stays in the center of the process, in, which means that we have to be in control, we have to know what is happening, and we have to be able to, to control the whole process. And this is where my colleague mm -hmm. is actually taking us. So we're living in times where we need to... Yeah, we need to learn how to work with what we call artificial intelligence. And a challenge that comes with this is that we need to define what is the human value in communication. And at the moment, I think we have good intuitions about what it is. Is it creativity? Is it the perception of an entire situation? Is it emotional impact? But we're still rather vague about it, right? So we need to understand better what, what is the, the specificity of human presence in a digitalized world? I think this is some, a broader question, actually. And of course, this has impact also on a, on a self-concept mm -hmm. self that at the moment is on self-confidence as well, but on, on a self-concept that at the moment is transient, right? And, and we need to understand better and we need to do research about it as well. What is it, the human value? you in communication when we work with AI. So um, a thriving industry, but with lots of lots of challenges. And that's what, what this image should, um, I think, illustrate. Um, the question is, yeah, what, what do we need for a successful professional journey in the language industry? And um, we've chosen this image because, as you can see, we're going towards the sun, into mm -hmm. the light, along the sea, but we need to keep moving, right? We need to keep moving all the time. And um, so, yeah, to answer this question, one first look at the diversity mm -hmm. in the industry. Exactly. So what we see is that, um, well, we had that those traditional roles of translators, interpreters, and maybe maybe like revisor terminologies, more or less, and, and, and a couple of more. And this has literally exploded into a huge number of job titles. So Slater uh, counted more than 700 industry language industry job titles. And this shows how uh, complex this change has been because it is very difficult to pinpoint exactly what you're doing in the language industry. And it's really difficult to say, this is a job description. Uh, before it was more, more simple, I think, and now it's, it's really complex. And this is where 
we think that instead of trying to find out and define very, very, very strict profiles, we should uh, take a different approach and define the competences that are required in the language industry or that all language industry professionals share. And uh, we see here four, um, not four competencies, but four uh, areas of competencies. And mm -hmm. the first one being, of course, core translation and cultural mediation competence. You may be reassured that we still believe this is, this is what characterizes us. Mm -hmm. They are at, still at the heart. So translating specialized content creatively, um, transcreating content into another language, adapting content to a specific field, um, group of users, um, making a content available within a language for, for specific groups. Um, so this is still this is still at the heart um, of, of who we are and what we're doing and what we like to do. But of course, always we need to do we need to do all we always need to do this um, in collaboration and interaction with the machine. You see here post editing, and that's where we come to the next field of competences, namely technological expertise. Exactly, and this is very important to see it as a, as a, as a spectrum, as a continuum of. Uh, varying expertise degree, um, so you can you can have a very strong technological expertise and 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 be a machine translation developer, for example, where you really program uh, program the machines, but you can also on the other um, side of the of the of the continuum, you could have this interactional expertise. This is I think this is the minimal expertise that you you need, which means that you know enough about AI in language to be able to have a seat at the table and talk with um, machine translation developers, uh, computer scientists who deal with natural language processing. So this interactional expertise is probably the entry level to this technological expertise, but then you have a wide range where you can, um, you can define where you would like to be. Um, yeah, next set of competences, management skills. We need to manage plenty of things, right? We need to man manage projects, of course, but also workflows. We need to manage our customers. We need to manage technology, acquisitions, maybe. And um, last but not least, we will always be able to, to manage, need to, to manage uh, change. So various types of management competences will be very important for the future as well. And next set of skills, consulting competences. I think we've always perceived ourselves as experts, but now I think we need to bring this expert knowledge to the table in a different way. We need to be able to um, make it relevant to others, to um, explain it to others in a self-confident way and um, to um, yeah, ch change, I think, our, our mm -hmm. role a little bit, our, our self-concept, right? Of course, we're still experts in language mediation, but we also need to go out there and, and convince people um, of the human value of our knowledge um, and convince them why, yeah, tell, explain to them why we're, why we're relevant. And I think, um, yeah, consultancy, visibility um, of, of our expertise will be, will be also very relevant um, in this digitalized world. Um, and I think the last set of skills uh, is also very well known to you, for all of you who know the AMT, and they have already been shining through in the, in the other set of skills, um, the soft skills. Um, the EMT has um, given a lot of attention to them, and I, and I really believe they are the foundation um, uh, for uh, success in, in the language industry, not only because they make us more employable, but just because they, they enhance our adaptability. Um, which is uh, a skill that that will be uh, very important in this um, in this always changing, constantly changing industry. So now we, we've seen different set of skills. Here is a summary: soft skills, the foundation, still at the at the heart, our core translation and cultural mediation competence, but other skills around them. And what is really our message um, today is that these skills cannot be seen separate anymore from our core competence. They really are now closely interlinked to it. And um, core translation and cultural mediation competence exists in combination with all of them. In the future, it will exist in combination with all of them. And this pod, only this whole entire portfolio of skills will allow you to then flexibly adapt to the various profiles that you can find in the language industry. Is that our main 
Message. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think here we're coming to the end um, and to um, one last uh, message. I think, of course, now we, we've seen the competence profile has become wider. It's, it has changed. Our role is adapting. Our self-confidence has to adapt. Our self-concept has to adapt. So um, the question is, do we need to rebrand what we're doing? Do we need to call it in a different way and to really um, yeah, to, um, uh, take into account uh, all, all the changes that are happening. And here's an, um, an umbrella term that we would like to suggest, multilingual communication design, emphasizing the creative aspect of, of language mediation, um, but also the, the, the agency aspect in designing workflows in contributing to the design of a digitalized world, mm -hmm. right? And um, here are our um, contact details um, uh, at, uh, at the IUD at uh, Zurich University of Applied Sciences, where we're trying to, as you can see here, uh, trying to embrace change in a very proactive way by designing our program in a way that builds on this portfolio of competences. And we're very happy to get in touch um, if you'd like to and have an exchange on, on these questions. And um, thank you very much for your attention on this Friday morning. We're exactly. very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla Nidalis. So I guess it's time for the question and answer. Before we start, I would like to remind you that we are also collecting feedback through Slido. Uh, so I will just pass the link to connect to Slido and the code of this session. You will find the word cloud which, with which you need to describe the main takeaways of this session by using one word. So yes, you're welcome to do so. We, I think we already have a question in the chat from uh, Michael Gornick. I hope I am pronouncing this hmm. well about what you think is the best way to acquire language and industry specific technological skills. And then he has the same question for consulting and management. Who would you like to take? Um, did I get it right? The best way to acquire them? Mm -hmm. uh, come to our institute to study. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather easy. But of course, I think lifelong learning is, is one um, key word here. Close collaboration with uh, the technologic the technology experts, right? With the MT developers. Can you speak um, about the CAAs that we have? We, for example, yeah, have a have a um, a certificate um, in continuing education where you have um, lectures with us and you have lectures with, with MT developers, so that you really get the entire perspective. Um, uh, and uh, management and consulting skills, I, I guess it's 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 a bit the same, right? We we should talk to those people who are really experts in in them and um, and um, yeah, learn from them. But of course, by adapting um, adapting these competences to our uh, our field and our specific um, needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, I think, uh, especially for management and consultancy, I think there is quite a lot going on in continuing education. Just, I think the language industry people like us haven't been uh, aware of or haven't thought about, A, I, I could go there. It's not a post-editing workshop, it's not a workshop for translators, for example, but actually I could I could go there and 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 take this learning from for myself. So I think this is more the step that we have to to perform at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it answer your question? <laughs> I guess it does. We have another question from uh, Michael Bailey, I think. Yes, regarding LIJI, I presume this is a metric regarding demand for translation. What does an increase from, say, 140.0 from to 160.0 mean in real terms, though? Mm -hmm. okay. can, can we the Sorry, the, um, do I you think see it was, the chat? Uh, we're, we're, we had a bit issues understanding okay. the, the question. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. What the increase in, in EI in productivity means? Oh, here. Um, this is yeah. Metric regarding demand for translation. Yeah, uh, to be honest, um, 
<laughs> we're not the experts here, we have to, to say. Um, usually, but Slater is one of the experts in that. Um, so what we took from the report is that uh, basically they said everything was going up. Uh, in real terms, the increase, well, from what I read in the report, the, uh, is that the increase is beyond, beyond the numbers that I would I would say I'm sorry, but I can't and can't really tell you what what it really means. Maybe maybe you have a better idea than I do, but um, in terms of I think diversification, what is happening is that the language language industry is diversifying. Uh, so there are many many jobs that are emerging, that are new, that are um, yeah or activities or uh, there is. I think there is a quite a, a large demand for localization, for accessibility uh, that hasn't been there before. So, um, and this this would be the explanation, I think. Yeah. Okay, we had another couple of questions in the chat from uh, Lisa Pirtilati, asking if your institute of remote studying opportunities. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> um, at the moment, we we are uh, working on on continuing education studies opportunities. Absolutely, we um, so this will be something that that was actually already in the in in the making. Uh, what we don't have at the moment is completely remote studies, like um, bachelor studies or master's degrees at the moment. But um, if many of you say we want to, then maybe. <laughs> But in continuing yeah. education, I yeah. think um, there will there yeah. will be um, many opportunities in the future, yeah. in the near future. Yeah. yeah, and this is quite easily done. So uh, if you're interested, please get in touch. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from uh, Alexander Bondarenko asking if uh, you don't think that the role of soft skills is a little bit overestimated. No, not at all, because they are the only skills which are completely timeless. Um, I think we're now living in a world where, or when we're training our students, right, we know what is happening now, but we don't really know what um, what their workplace will look like in 30 years. I think that's just at the moment, it's not possible. And But what we know is that if they have the right soft skills, they will be able to adapt to it. They will be able to learn, they will be able to deal with the change, they will be able to self-motivate themselves. Um, to adapt to new environments and that's why I think they they are um, not the only relevant skill set but they are very relevant yeah yeah I would I, I would even say sorry can I, mean, I add to the question mm -hmm. I just yeah wanted hi. To, the problem is that it was only a part of the question I was speaking hi and it's my question and actually I'm a PhD in translation and watching uh, now the conference with my students and my students yeah. so the question yeah. was a bit narrower I was speaking about Eastern Europe and the mm -hmm. problem here is that uh, we still have our hard skills not trained. And when we see the Eastern Europe, we see that, wow, soft skills, we have to grasp them. Mm -hmm. And we have situation mm -hmm. when soft skills are okay, but hard skills, the ability to translate is not so good. So this is a mm, problem. You're, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I understand your problem much better. Yeah. They, they, they come on top mm -hmm. of other skills. Uh, absolutely. And 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 That's we it. presume That's that it. these yeah. other skills are there. Yeah. 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 This is we, we try to show it in the model. The core translation skills they are still there. They won't they won't go anywhere. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there is no <laughs> compromise there. Yeah. We don't, yeah. At at no yeah. point, even if the machine Thank is you. great. Yeah. <laughs> this, this stage, this remains completely. Yeah. Um, but what the soft skills can do, it can help you acquire these core skills quicker or better yeah. or in a more efficient Agreed. way. So I think this it, it is worth a shot saying, yeah, uh, don't focus completely only on translate on, on teaching translation, but maybe That's have it. like a bit of it yeah. because these soft skills like like um, working with other people for example and i mean we know it as translators we <laughs> some of us don't like to work with other people and that's why we chose this job <laughs> especially in the morning before no. coffee no but this is this is something that i think is on on long run is also allowing you to adapt because if you have the soft skills then you 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 are able to develop all your life long so you can really become a great translator or no. linguist let's say whatever whatever you're or multilingual communication designer 
Yeah. Sure, but sure. thank you for this interesting yeah. uh, uh, question you. that allowed us to, to refine yeah. what yeah. we said. Thank you. Thank you and say much. hi to your students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. You. Sorry to interrupt. But we had they are watching you. Yeah. Questions. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Magali Rocha asking on how to build a, such a, a successful translation career in such a challenging market. This is a tough one. Yeah. Come to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Sorry. how to build a successful career. I think we've tried to give you some ideas of the competences, you the skills you 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 need, and which which may may help you. And um, um, be positive about change. I think I think if 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 we are not, maybe the language industry is not the right place yeah. for, for us anymore. Yeah. So what we have seen, at least, and also in continuing education, um, people who have. Uh, the stance or the discourse saying, you know what, Google Translate is great, it works perfectly, but uh, you know what, but yeah, let's let's see what I can do with that, and then you will see how how wonderful it is when a human uh, when a human specialist expert is in the loop. Um, it's a much more successful approach than saying, oh no, um, Google Translate is really not good. You should you should always ask me. So at this. This, this would be the only small tip that I give you, and I think uh, most of you already do that, but it's just don't talk bad about the machine because people who are not translators are very happy with the machine. They don't see why. So I think we have to pick them up. And it's very mm -hmm. important for a career because it's 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 knowing how to talk to clients, to mm -hmm. potential clients, how to sell your, your USP. And this is really about saying, hey, you know what, it's great. And with me on top of it, then you're going to shine. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's more about this idea uh, of it really positive. And don't be afraid. Um, the jobs are not going anywhere. They're really here. That's uh, that's important to see. But maybe it's not the job that our parents or grandparents mm -hmm. have been doing, but that's OK. Um, yeah, well, that that's really OK, I think, because there are new opportunities that are coming. And I think you should be open for it and curious and really I think the consultancy part is extremely important. Before we didn't have to do that that much, but now we really have to be able to talk to the clients. This is uh, and and to talk great to the clients, yeah, and to convince them yeah. of of our relevance exactly yeah. in a non-defensive way. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so have fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we have another couple of questions. The first one is from Sandrine Grenier who's asking, would you recommend to complete translation jobs with a side one? Sorry, to Who would like to take it? Would you recommend to complete the translation jobs with a side one? With another, with with another, another job. job? Yes. Um, well, some people are starting, of course, as freelancers by, by having um, multiple jobs and build up their, their, their portfolio um, step by step. Um, I think this really depends on on your preference on on your career if you're working freelance if you're looking for a for a st um or if you'd like to be staff uh, work as staff translator somewhere um in the beginning it might be good advice mm -hmm. i don't know what you're thinking yeah i think it, it depends on what well of course i mean on, on the money you need because if may, maybe you can't afford to be only a freelancer mm -hmm. at the beginning and then mm -hmm. it's okay that's that's what i did at the beginning i had a job well at the university but um, a small job as a, as a student, a student job at the university. I worked at, at a cinema too. I was selling popcorn, if you want to know <laughs> it. Uh, and I was translating, um, remote translator for uh, freelancing. Uh, and I was happy about it. This, this was my way. Uh, I also had kids during my freelance career. So for me, it was perfect. But uh, I, I I know some friends who said no. I want to to have an experience, for example, in an institution, or I want to try and work a bit in a company as a translator, as part of a team, and come to the office. And then, when I have this experience, and I can uh, I can be a freelance translator. I think this is where actually the job is great because. Um, you can do it, you can choose, you can manage how you, you want to do. If you're freelancing, basically, you can more or less choose how many, uh, how much you take on, on, from freelancing. Um, and of, of course, it's, it's kind of legwork and, and stuff, but then you can combine it greatly with another job if you want to have another job. 
to be honest, at times like this, I would recommend that you do something that makes you happy. Because if you're happy, then you are good. And, and then everything everything's more is, is more simple, to be honest, yeah. Okay, and I think nobody's in the translation industry just for the money. So try and be happy with your job and enjoy it. Everything else, no, there's no time for it. It's a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Sorry, should I say that? Totally. <laughs> so uh, we are running out of time, so I think we'll be able to take one last question from uh, Delia Pagano, who is asking, do you think all this can be packed into a BA plus MA program? And what good is it if students actually never get hands-on experience? I think it. Um, at the moment we were just redesigning our program. I think it can be packed into an MA uh, program indeed, but of course, um, our our idea is that that we give our students a kind of basic set of skills in all of these areas, um, but with a perspective of lifelong learning, right? So that they can specify in things and um, improve their knowledge step by step throughout their careers as well. So um, I think today we're no longer um, um, having this idea that when once you've completed your masters, your your time of, of learning is is over, right? You have a um, a solid basic set of, of skills and um, then you you improve continuously in, in particular areas that um, are important for your specific career. Um, so um, with this ideas in mind, I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I always say translation studies or translation curricula, like a driving license. When you, I don't, I don't know, I, I learned how to drive in France, so <laughs> probably the worst country to do that ever but okay uh, but and then when you got when you get your driving license actually you can't drive you can more or less drive but you're not a good driver but then you go on and drive and 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 and, and pick up some skills on the way and pick up some some habits and, and and learn so what you have is is the ground the base and this base this has to be good and this has to have soft skills consultancy skills a bit of uh, interactional technological expertise and everything has to be in there yes but you don't have to be the world's best translator when you, even even after your master's degree because you 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 might become the world's best translator but this comes this comes with the job this comes with doing it's, it's a lot of learning by doing especially in that area so what is good if you have the good foundation and i think the programs they can provide these foundations if they have the, um, yeah if they, if they want to now we also know why the French drive the way they do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a, I see in the chat there are a lot of questions, but unfortunately we are running over time. We are already over time, but we're going to save the chat for your use. And uh, I think we can start wrapping up. So thank you very much, Caroline and Alice, for being here with us. Thank you. And, uh, Yes, enjoy the rest of the conference. This is our last day and uh, we keep in touch. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We're happy to be here and get in touch with us if, if you like to. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all the participants Bye. who joined. Bye. Bye. <laughs>